I'm Jackie Schertz. Welcome to Hey Listen. February is Black History Month, and tonight's topic will be about black people who are also deaf, and we will be having two guests, Carl Moore and John Haynes. We will be discussing under education and under employment, two severe problems in the deaf black community. We're wondering if black people are that different. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hey Listen. Tonight's topic is about black deaf people. February is Black History Month, and that's why we're having tonight's special show. We have two guests, John Haynes, who is a tool and die maker. He's a journeyman at Eastman Kodak. He's also the vice president of the Rochester Hearing Impaired Lions Club and a graduate from NTID. That's the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. Next to John, we have Carl Moore, who is a counselor at NTID in the College of, well, you're in the career counseling area, is that correct? In the visual communication area? He's also an advisor to the NTID student club called Ebony Club. He has a master's degree in re rehabilitation counseling. We're very honored to have you two guests this e this today. We're talking about how it is to be black and deaf. Are you black first or deaf first? How do you identify yourself? For me, I think of myself first as a deaf person. <coughs> I was born into a black family. My entire family's deaf. And my entire family's black. I didn't learn about deafness till I went to school. And it was just natural to me growing up in a black family to think of myself as black. So I guess my identity is as a deaf person. You grew up in a black family, so you felt like there was nothing different about yourself until you learned that you were deaf. So you're deaf first and then black because of the way you grew up. Now, now how do you feel? Now I still feel that, well, I'm a black deaf person. Uh, I still call myself deaf, I guess, first. And Carl? I know for many black deaf people, individuals who are from the black community, often feel that they're black first because they're born into the black community. You see, growing up in that experience, you feel a commonality amongst black people. Once you start school, then you begin to notice the, deaf the difference between your family and, and the hearing people. You begin to notice this at first in school. That's when I began to notice that I was different. When I went back home, then I started to do some comparisons, noticed how people communicated around the neighborhood, and I realized there was something different about me. As I grew up, my communication improved. And through school, you know, well, 
I was in the black community for most of my schooling when I was early, when I'm early on in, in my education. And then later, I noticed when I was when I was transferred to the hearing impaired program. This was a mainstream program in a mainstream school, and those services tended to be in the white community. And I was uh, forced to be bused back and forth. So I was over in a neighboring community for my education. And this was in a white community where most of the culture was a mainstream white culture. The teachers were all, all mostly white. Um, and I, I went through that educational experience and I realized that it, there was something really different about me. I was hearing impaired. I began to think of myself as hearing impaired first rather than black first. So this was sort of a, a change for me in my uh, identity. Okay, <coughs> so suppose that you're in a group that is black with hearing black people. How do you feel at that time? Well, first you have to understand that I grew up uh, in the black hearing community. And my siblings knew sign language. We could communicate with each other easily. Uh, and they'd tell people, you know, my brother's deaf. So I had that as a buffer. And people would get to be comfortable with me because my brother could always interpret for me. Uh, I never really felt uncomfortable in that setting. So with black hearing people, you feel more of a strong bond with deafness? Is that what you mean? Well, they've been very supportive of me, yes. Uh, I've been involved in all sorts of activities and accepted that way. My family and community that I grew up in was all black, and I was quite proud of being black. I, we depended on one another greatly. We would do favors for, you know, our mother and father or things like that. Not many black families were really quite successful. Uh, it depends often on what kind of work the, the parents have. I really feel proud of my black heritage and the black community. Uh, the groups are getting better as they go along. Um, Dr. King's work has really helped advance our cause. His dream has helped people succeed in getting jobs and education. And it's due to that that, uh, well, um, you were saying black, uh, could you repeat? Yes. Well, actually, I have two situations that I'd like to compare. With hearing black people, how do you feel? And the second part of my question is really, how do you feel with white <coughs> deaf people? Do you feel a closer bond with which group? Where do you fit in? I think I feel most at home with my family even though sometimes it's frustrating from time to time with communication, but I'm most proud of my family that we've stuck together and we've maintained close relationships. I do have quite a relationship with deaf people and the deaf community and the white deaf community <coughs> through organizations that I go to and different civic events and clubs and meetings and things like that. I do appreciate that community and I use sign language. In the past, when I was growing up, I didn't know sign language. I went to an oral school and uh, it was oral only. I wasn't allowed to sign until I got into a the National Technical Institute for the Deaf is where I learned sign language. Before that, I'd learned a bit of total communication. And when I got back to home, people said, hey, what's with your hands? Why are you moving your hands? And you haven't done that so far. And I realized that there were some differences here, that I'd learned sign language from, uh, sign language from NTID. And I'm, I'd learned more and more about, I was able to teach my family and my mother specifically more about hearing impaired people and deafness. And they weren't maybe so interested about it. They uh, were sort of maybe interested in the hearing impaired part about it, but I have five sisters and one brother. So there were seven of us all together. Four are hearing impaired and three are hearing. And the entire, for all of us, the communication approach is oral. In the black community, very similar to the white community, you know, the doctor will advise the parents, well, at least for my oldest, for the oldest sibling, he became sick with rubella. My mother, of course, took him right away to the doctor, and they checked him out and said he was hearing impaired. And they seemed to accept it, because my mother was hearing impaired. 
with, with the second kid, which was me, I was born, and I, I was hearing impaired, they knew at birth, and they seemed to accept that pretty well, but later, my parents started questioning me, and they weren't sure of what the cause was. The doctor hadn't recorded it on the medical records. See, the professional community amongst black people is very small, and the professional community among white people is quite big, and the hearing culture has really influenced my mother, and that's why we weren't allowed to learn sign language. We were sent towards an oral approach, and that's the way we progressed through school. I accepted my hearing problems, the, my hearing impairment. When I went to NCID, I learned more about sign language and deafness, but um, with my family, my sister and others learned sign language, and I really feel comfortable and accepted within my family. For me at home and in the black community, uh, I communicate sometimes signing, but through speech reading and speaking and writing back and forth. And I find that often if I'm with white deaf people, they know sign language. And, you know, at a residential school for the <coughs> deaf, it's a different community. And that's where I first learned sign language. Uh, I was, it was an oral school, really, but, you know, anytime we were on break or at lunchtime, everyone signed. And we signed behind the teacher's back all the time. So we always used sign language. And we'd get scolded for it. We weren't allowed to do it, but I acquired sign language growing up. Do white deaf people oppress black deaf people? As I was growing up, I was in a mainstream school, and all the kids were hearing impaired. And I felt sort of proud of that. I was oral, just like they were. There was the Edmonton School for the Hearing Impaired, and uh, one thing one day bothered me. They said I was a pig, or they signed this. I didn't understand what it was. So I, they said I was dirty. Was it I was dirty? I mean, did I smell or something? <laughs> I mean, was there a problem I, that I wasn't aware of? I mean, I wasn't sure what they really meant by this. So I went to the bathroom, of course, and washed up, and I came back and said, no, I'm clean. And they said, no, you're dirty. And I'm, what do you mean by dirty? I didn't quite understand this. They said, you're black. That means you're dirty. I said, it's not true. Come on. I went to the bathroom and washed up. I'm not dirty. Come on. You mean me as a person, I'm dirty? They, these people thought that being black meant was being black and automatically that you were dirty, and this got me going. <laughs> I was really upset about it, and I remembered this. And in some ways, it, I developed scars as a result of this sort of oppression. Later on, I began to notice the difference between black and white people and sort of studied it. Many black students are are emphasized, and actually the, the emphasis for their programs is vocational. And for white students, they're sent off to academic programs. So I see myself in some ways as being special because, you know, I, I felt the same as the black deaf people, and I was somewhat encouraged towards a vocational career, <coughs> but it, somehow I was led into being in, in the academic area. So with this anger, I, it sort of forced me or pushed me to succeed in education. I developed a more of an interest in reading. My parents emphasized that school was important in order to get a good job and have a good future. And I remembered that. Even though sometimes I was alone in that situation, I knew my family was behind me and supporting me all the way. <laughs> you were talking about success. Both of you are successful deaf people, black deaf people. And is education, is that what leads to success? What other things lead to success? When you talk about success, success, what do you feel? I think by being independent. As I was growing up, my mom really taught me well and encouraged me to get a lot of education. She passed away when I was about 11. And my brother and I and our siblings uh, were kind of on our own. Our dad always worked. And we really became independent in our study and had a lot of drive, willing to take on challenges. And I was strongly encouraged to go to college and pursue additional education. That really helped in my development. And when it was time to go to college, I had to make a choice where to go for myself. And after that, 
Well, I planned to go to work with my dad after I graduated from school and realized I needed more education. I was encouraged to go on to college, and I was really eager to pursue the goals I have. Okay, we need to take a break right now. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're continuing with our topic about black deaf people. I've gone to different conventions, the National Association of the Deaf and also the Telecommunications Devices Incorporated conventions, and I've noticed that there aren't many deaf people at those meetings. There aren't many black deaf people there. What is the reason for that? In my opinion, most black deaf people feel perhaps not ready or in some ways comfortable to get involved with that community. Uh, also, I think there's some issues related to education and they don't feel they have enough experience to take leadership roles there. And they're more at home perhaps in their own community or with organizations like Black Deaf Advocates. Uh, we have a strong chapter in New York City, and there was a national convention in Detroit last year, and a lot of black deaf people really enjoy those sorts of conventions and meeting similar people at conventions like PDA. Mm -hmm. uh, there were over 300 people there from all over the United States, and I think you see more involvement in that sort of a effort and community. <coughs> I'd like to add to that. He's speaking about the National Black Deaf Advocate Organization which was set up 18 years ago. And the main purpose for it being set up was to build a sense of black individual self-esteem and uh, to collect black professional opinion related to the black deaf community. I went to the NAD convention before, but there's not much black deaf leadership there. They feel frustrated within the National Association of the Deaf. The National Association of the Deaf has state chapters all over the states, well, there's, you know, 50 states, when they get together as a national convention and folks come in from all over the country, it's mostly white people. I'd say 2,000, 3,000 people. But they're, like, as you say, there might be four or five black deaf people there. So in the national meetings, people are frustrated. They don't feel comfortable sharing with one another. Uh, and they're often just frustrated in those meetings. The NAD convention tends to vote and in some ways oppress these people uh, because the representation is based on delegates and the ability to vote is based on delegates. So the Black Deaf Advocates has challenged NAD to change their voting system and NAD has placed them low on their priority list. So the Black Deaf Advocates decided to go out on their own and set up their own uh, black deaf brothers and sisters, which is now growing and growing. And the NAD has seen this and as is asking them, why aren't you growing with us? Why aren't you joining us? And the black deaf advocates has expressed that they don't want to be oppressed by the NAD. We'd be happy to send representatives and everything, but we don't wish to be underneath that organization. Now there's more than 11 chapters of BDA already. BDA has 11 chapters, isn't it? Oh. I see. They are state chapters, yes. Now there's 10. 
that are recognized officially, but there's more growing. Yes, and there's one that's in the process of being established. At NAD conventions and, and <coughs> TDI, there aren't many black deaf people, but at different sports associations, um, basketball tournaments, there are a lot of black deaf people. Of course. Are they more interested in, in sports than politics? Is that the reason? Perhaps. Well, generally, I would say that's true. Uh, for now, uh, we who are successful black deaf people, you know, may choose to be involved with BDA, Black Deaf Advocates, or not limit ourselves to that organization. It might be involved in the white organization. Um, black Deaf Advocates supports folks for, it's really a more of a grassroots type of organization, and there's a lot more involvement. And the reason being that we need more interpreters who are black. We need more professionals and audiologists who are black. That, and we need to promote people that have hearing impairments to get better jobs. There's a large number of white people and a large number of services for white deaf people. But the black community seems, in some ways, just not ready or prepared we uh, black deaf people and organizations try to influence the white community and also to educate one another about deafness. Okay, thank you. Do we have some comments from the studio audience? I'm wondering, what's your oh, goal and what are your aspirations to fostering these organizations? Education. Education is really the number one priority. Because many black deaf children in the classroom are mainstreamed. They're not sent to the residential schools for deaf children. And they don't have the proper teachers. They have maybe black hearing teachers or white hearing teachers. They don't have deaf teachers. I mean, it's important for students to develop their self-esteem and to have role models and to develop inspiration from those role, role models. Oftentimes they develop wrong attitudes and a passive approach to life. So they don't identify their teachers as being models and they tend to suppress a lot of their pride. It would be good for them to have role models so they could identify with them and follow these role models towards success. Yes, we have a question over here. Yes, please stand. I'd like to, to ask both of you a question. What kind of advice would you give black children who are growing up in today's world? Good question. What I'd advise black deaf children today is get all the education you can and share your experiences openly and honestly with one another and become involved in the community, involved in service, community service, helping others, attending workshops, and help work to make a better future. For me, I think my advice would be to find other young black deaf children and uh, to continue in school throughout their lives, to maintain an interest in education, and also to keep up with their family and, and try to get support from their family, especially their parents. I mean, whether they're deaf or they have a hearing impairment, it's important for them to be with their family doctor and ask questions about the loss so that the entire family can understand what's happening here. Sometimes a school psychologist can be helpful in the family gaining an understanding of hearing impairment. Also, with the family, with black family often involved in church, that's helpful. Otherwise, people tend to be led <laughs> towards drugs or other poor influences. The research shows that 98% of all deaf people are from hearing parents. So that means both black and white. So if this is to be the same for the black population, one of the things that's successful in our community is the support that we gain from one another. So I would encourage black young deaf children to not give up even though they might have problems and frustrations, to maintain their connection with their family and to go to school for as long as they can and seek counseling towards understanding their hearing impairment. Thank you. 
Yes, uh, you've been talking a lot about education, and I'm wondering if the black deaf person's educational experience is different than the white deaf person's educational experience. And if so, how is it different? I think often it depends on the parents. Uh, certainly they provide their children with love and motivation and encouragement. Uh, if they re have trouble accepting that their child's deaf, certainly that can have an impact as they're raising the child. And I think really parents need to seek out advice and help from their family physician or psychologist. And they really need to help their children as they're growing up, and that's key. I think there's, a, there's not really much difference in some ways, but it does depend on the community and the school itself. For example, in the South, for example, North Carolina, where I worked as a counselor, in the private community services that they have available, a variety of client clients come in. And most of the clients are white deaf people that I was counseling. And I would ask them and learn about their community. In the South, there tends to be quite a bit of difference between black deaf children and most white children are Morganton, are, are in different schools. Morganton, North Carolina is one. So they've taken these two schools and combined them into one. And there's the signing styles are different. And uh, it's been very interesting to observe the development of these two schools. There were some differences, but now when they have put these two schools together, you can see different signing styles and different educational experiences coming together. The, for the white community, the education is similar. Well, the signing is similar, but there's also more total communication. I see some differences. In the north, many schools are already mainstreamed, or schools for the deaf are already established strongly. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, I'm wondering who were your role models growing up? Did you have black deaf role models? Yes, I did. Al Kuthan? He was a, uh, Al Kuthan, he was a principal at the Model Secondary Demonstration School. He was one, well there was one other, but I can't remember his name. Do you have someone that you aspire to that's black and deaf? Black deaf role model, boy that'd be tough. Uh, I pursued a technical field and you just don't see many black deaf professionals in the technical schools yet as teachers. Uh, certainly, you know, teachers, psychologists, social workers. No, it doesn't have to be black and deaf. Someone that you aspired to when you were young. Certainly my dad, my father, he worked as a plumber and now he's still working. Okay, we're going to take another break now. We'll be right back. Stay with us.
more on black deaf people. I've heard some problems, some negative things about being black and deaf. Can you tell me some positive things about being black and deaf? Sure, I'd be glad to. I've heard some negative things about being, I've heard some negative things about being black and deaf. Can you tell me some positive things about being black and deaf? Sure. I'd be, well, I'd, uh, I'm happy to know that there are many, many successful black deaf people in the United States. Many of them are not involved with the black deaf advocates. They're involved in business. They have heavy responsibilities with their jobs, and they're not interested in community organizations. They're rather independent. They don't have much connection to the deaf community. They're out on their own. I wish sometimes they'd be more involved in our civic events, but they're not. For myself, I'm quite cr proud to be a black deaf American that's successful. And I'm happy to have role models from my black hearing teachers and some of my white hearing teachers. And amongst my deaf teachers, I didn't have any until I came to NTID. Some, I have some black deaf friends who are quite like me and we share, we're professionals, and we share our experiences and talk with one another. And I have friends, you know, that are family, friends of my family members, and folks in the local area. But I do like to travel a lot and meet a lot of good black deaf friends around the country, and for a variety of reasons, just socialize with one another. And we ask one another, how did you succeed? And what were the things that made a difference for you? And I gather experience from their experience. Yes, thank you. I before we were talking about black deaf sign language, um, is there a difference between that and white, black, white deaf sign language? Is there a sign jive? Do you have that? Yeah, there are a lot of lexical items you might call jive. Uh, I think where you have a group of black deaf people together with that sense of community and feeling at home, there's certainly a different signing style. Uh, when they're out with hearing people or other folks, they tend to use more an English form of signing or perhaps uh, standard American sign language when they're with white deaf friends because they don't want anyone left out. So I think it really depends on the setting you're in. Uh, or sometimes people change their signing style to accommodate interpreters and make it easier for them. Uh, it's hard to really perhaps see examples unless you're involved heavily in the community and certainly there you see it modeled and could learn it. With black deaf people, you sign a little bit differently, but when, when you mix with white deaf people, do you keep your black deaf language to yourself? Why? Perhaps. <coughs> well, I notice that it's just not used out in public. Uh, uh, perhaps, you know, street talk or streetwise folks in bigger cities, such as Philadelphia, <coughs> Chicago, Detroit, the major population centers. Shortly after graduation in 85, I studied sign language, well, for three years. I mean, I'm not proficient with ASL, but my home is in Philadelphia, you see. And I wanted to know more about black deaf churches and services within the black deaf community. And I went to, th they had a church in that community with black deaf people there. And they tended to get in one congregation because there was a program there. They would invite speakers from other deaf organizations and hearing organizations and also disabled organizations that would come to give speeches there. There were 60 black deaf people in this group. Some were older and quite conservative. Some were middle-aged and had children. I mean, this is a, uh, quite a variety within the community. I mean, this is great. I loved it. <laughs> and it was interesting. I mean, a lot of people were really cool there. You know, they'd be saying, what's happening? You know, uh, yeah. And you want to party with me? Come on. You know, this is amazing stuff for me. I mean, I hadn't seen this before. This was pretty tough for me to follow. And one black older fellow came by and said, have you heard the rumors that you've, or ha I, it's a rumor that you've been through college. And I said, yeah, that's true. And this is the first person that we've ever met that's been through college. And I introduced myself and talked to them, and he said, my name is, and 
is very you know English thinking that I'm really being really thinking that I'm being very conservative and I wanted to sign with those folks and he sort of interpreted for me and he talked <laughs> signed really fast and this was different for me I this was hard at first I hadn't had this experience until I was involved for a while and it attended for quite some time then I was accepted or actually led into this group outside of church I was able to learn more sign language and meet with some of these folks and I noticed there was some difference between the white ASL and the black ASL. It seemed somehow different, more <laughs> gestural, a lot more loose. <laughs> and it sort of broke up my conservative nature. <laughs> and they would ask me to not share this language, you know, about maybe drugs or partying or stuff like that, or theft. <laughs> you know, there'd be a lot of winking going on about <laughs> what not to say and what you should say. And I was quite naive with this whole thing. And I joined this, you know, I joined a, a group one night they had a, a deaf, a deaf bunch of deaf folks got together and uh, we had card games in the basement. And I wasn't invited. And I asked the leader, might I come to one of the time, one of the get-togethers? And they said, are you a uh, partier or are you straight? And I said, well, I'm rather straight. And the leader said, well, uh, I'm afraid that you <laughs> might rat on us. You might not keep the secrets. So he came over and chatted with me one time, and we got friendly and talked with one another and I was invited after that and I learned the secrets uh, how to get dates how to solve your problems where to get help and I learned quite a bit from this group when I met with them everything was very informal uh, and you know in my work as a professional I had to dress appropriately for a professional so you know it's important for black deaf organizations to share you know some of this street wise <laughs> philosophy that really helps as i was growing up in new york city i had quite a few black friends and often you know as we got to know each other really well and well they'd heard i'd left for rochester to try and find some work and to go to college and they knew i'd be able to take care of myself and as i got to the deaf club I noticed that, you know, there'd be, when the Deaf Club would open early in the evening, there'd be quite a few black people there. And as the night went on, they'd tend to disappear. And then they started to get invited to go with them. And the group of black deaf people there would leave together, maybe go over someone's house, have our own discussions about our business, uh, where perhaps some of the other people weren't involved. And, you know, it was tough for me sometimes. I wanted to go out and socialize, but also I wanted to concentrate on my schooling and getting my education. So there were some conflicting attractions there. But also, you know, I knew what things were like from being in New York City. Some organizations that are deaf organizations want to recruit more black people and have more interaction with black, the black community, but haven't been able to do the networking somehow. Um, it seems to be a private group. It's a hard group to outreach to. I've been looking at the situation where we have white hearing people as compared to white deaf people. And you know, deaf people tend to be very sort of touchy-feely. They, they have a small space. And, and it seems that when I see black folks, they seem to have a lot of um, codes, a lot of handshakes and that type of thing. I'm wondering if black deaf people have even more of these type of behaviors because they're black and deaf. It depends on where you're from. I mean, for example, in the big cities, they often have like a club there. And <coughs> you'll see this sort of stylistic behavior sort of stuff, you know, almost like they're a movie star or something. And, you know, the deaf people who feel together, you know, they'll do these sort of fancy handshakes and stuff like that. But perhaps they've been from the same residential school. Now, you see, for a student that's been through a mainstream environment, it's quite different. My home is in Philadelphia, and I was mainstreamed, and I was in an oral program. And the black deaf kids in my group just didn't know sign language. We were emphasized, uh, we emphasized vocabulary and English. We didn't have much interaction with black deaf folks. And it wasn't just, it wasn't so great not having that, not learning that language, because I was in an oral program. See many black deaf Americans in Philadelphia now with jackets. They are all the same. 
and the hats all at the same angle. And, you know, I wondered how they established this uh, manner of walking all the same and all these different customs. I mean, I wanted to develop this sort of thing for myself, too. I mean, it, it's quite a, quite a boost to their self-esteem to have this sort of thing. Other black deaf people see this and don't accept it. They see it as, you know, they see themselves as being professional, they go to church, they dress professionally and appropriately, and they're not interested in uh, looking like some of these street gang members. Or, um, they want to be more respectful and more tame. So, <coughs> so some of the people feel they have more control in their group as a result of these kind of behaviors. From my experience, in a mainstream school, it seems that we develop more of a hearing sensibility. We respect each other, and and I had to transfer to a deaf school for some reason. And and at that point, I learned a lot more about deaf culture. Deaf people tend to like to play around and maybe don't have a whole lot of respect or show a lot of respect the way we're used to seeing it. But in a mainstream program, I see more attention to homework. And in the uh, deaf school, I learned how to mo be more like a deaf person. And so I learned a lot of things from the different situations. I started out signing very slowly, and then I moved up and was going more and more rapidly. And then I graduated from a deaf school. So as I look back, I really am happy with the experience I've had. Good, thank you. You were talking about the adjustment from the deaf community into the hearing community. Also, um, white people and black people act differently, have different behaviors. We need to take a break right now, and we'll continue with this in just a moment. <laughs> We're going on with our discussion about black deaf people. Okay. <clears throat> Most hearing black people um, have a problem with being discriminated in, in the job situation. Being black and deaf, do you feel that's a double, quote, handicap? If so, how have you overcome that? Well, in response to your question, I feel that sometimes I feel as a black hearing person with, you know, in this giant United States white culture, uh, the black people are certainly a minority. As a black deaf person, I mean, you combine black and deafness, and it's a double discrimination in some ways. <coughs> I often try not to think negatively about 
myself being black or myself being deaf or hearing impaired or deaf. I mean, I, I don't try to identify myself that way. I try to identify myself as a person first and second as a professional. You know, I know what my, I know what job is expected of me. I've read my job description and I, I know what I'm responsible for. So I set myself goals in order to meet my expectations. My self-assessment, I do have a personality. I am a human person. You know, in my job situations, I'm, I'm often confronted with an entire white environment, but I have to maintain a positive outlook. Being a black deaf person, you know, I also happen to be a black deaf professional. But putting all that stuff aside, and speaking about my job, people need to have respect for me as a professional, that I have the skills and qualifications to meet the challenges of the job. You know, suppose some issue comes up and I'm willing to join the discussion or perhaps lead a discussion. I'm not willing to talk about my personal problems in the workplace. I'd rather resolve, there somewhere, resolve that somewhere else, maybe perhaps with my supervisor. I'd ask for assistance. You know, and then perhaps we would find some plan to do something about it. Each job has its own set of procedures so that you can work with your supervisor in order to get support. Perhaps uh, you see your supervisor's supervisor, or perhaps go to the personnel office and meet with a representative there. For me, when I think of work, and when I first went to work at Kodak, I know there were some training programs available. And what happened was my boss <coughs> happened to know sign language. That really helped me a lot. And we started working together pretty closely. I could get some courses, take some classes, and interpreters were provided. And in fact, there was a program. And when I graduated, I went to work as an engineer. And also, my boss could still interpret a bit for me, you know, some of the job meetings or if we were working on projects. And he became really familiar with uh, the engineering functions. And I started to develop a lot more independence to where I could function on my own, either through writing or speech reading. Uh, some of the workers, my coworkers, knew a little finger spelling. That helped a lot. And, you know, most of the conversation was related to our technical work, so there was that commonality that made it easier to communicate, and I've gotten along really well on the job. When I first arrived, I know I was the first deaf person in my department in that whole area, and there was a lot of question about, oh my gosh, how's John going to fit in? And I think, you know, there might have been a little bit of resistance, or perhaps it was just the novelty of the whole situation. And the job was new to me, but as I got to know people there, and they got to know me, and we got on with the work, uh, I could help them out, they could help me out, there were certainly experienced tool makers there, and the job was something we all had in common. And once I demonstrated the quality of work I could do, they had a lot more confidence in me, and things just progressed smoothly. Okay, we have a question over here. The two of you have <coughs> some experience as leaders, and I've recognized that some black young people have not gotten involved with that. Um, I'm wondering what kind of activities they could participate in to gain that experience, and what do you think um, they could do to improve their skills? I, if I understand what you're saying, it's like, for often like with the National Black Deaf Advocates Organization, there's a few black hearing people that attend these conferences. And there's also a few white representatives from, well, say here, well, different organizations in the community. And we try to explain to the different white mainstream schools and the white schools and encourage white professionals to attend our conference, to learn more. To, we try to educate them about black deaf children's needs and teach them on how to be sensitive to their needs. It's often up to the professional, the teacher, and for the most part, to change the attitudes of the children. Often black deaf children would prefer to develop a passive role because they see the white teacher as being different and themselves as black, so that's not a role that they could get. 
You know, they're not sure that that's, they'd be supported if they were able to take on a role like that. It doesn't matter if the white teacher is hearing or deaf. They really should encourage the student to get involved in activities. You know, I mean, today people should know that education should be equal for everyone. But oftentimes the principal will let the students go without caring as much and not paying as much attention to the students' needs. Yes, here uh, there's a question from the audience. <coughs> I know, I'm wondering about your goals. It seems that there's a lot of segregation still among different groups of blacks and whites. I'm wondering if you want to get black and white deaf people together or is it okay that they're still apart? For me, I'd like to see people get together almost socially, perhaps, um, learn a bit more about each other and how to improve in the community. And sometimes you need to do that separately first to build some sort of power base and confidence. Uh, then later you can have some sort of shared experience and meeting after each group's confident and build some strength. So I think people need to get together cooperatively, not competitively. And working together and with media, people can set up a variety of workshops or planned activities where they can meet on common ground. I know often there's different organizations and different groups. And, uh, we do need those role models, as you're saying. Everyone needs to be involved, whether it's principals, superintendents of schools. I think, for my opinion, I would prefer the recognition you know, uh, to separate sometimes the two groups, um, especially when it comes to the needs and attention that the different groups present. We have a black deaf group. They're not asking for special attention from you, but we as a group know what our needs are and know what our experiences are. We have a shared base of common experience. And we would prefer at times to have black deaf professionals interact with them. You know, have family doctors that are, d that are black. <coughs> to have uh, schools with black people in working in the schools so that the students can develop role models. Um, in some ways, just to develop their own community, their own little world, the church, uh, everything. You know, organizations that would focus on black people and black children and black adults and serve their needs. White, commu white community and white society has plenty of stuff, and they seem to be meeting their needs quite well. Uh, in the future, I would like to see the black community organizations develop one another and eventually start inviting the white community to attend their groups and have the black deaf people organize and manage their own organizations rather than the reverse, which is where we encourage black deaf students to go and join the white organizations. You know, they're encouraged often to join the white hearing organizations. And so this process is sure going to take time. Black deaf people need their space. They don't mean to push away people, but they need their own space to meet their specific needs. For me, individually, I've been in a mainstream group because that's been my experience. I've also been in an oral group. But I often go to workshops for, for, for professionals, different training, in order to, to gather a variety of experiences. And these are where a lot of hearing people come in, and I don't mind going to these workshops. I'm, you know, motivated to learn. I have a, a motivated, motivated attitude. Uh, I can share the experience of a black deaf American or a professional or someone that has a strong family. I mean, whatever issues there are in those conventions, I feel that I could make a contribution. I mean, you know, perhaps there's an organization of white, rich businessmen. I might like to be the first black, rich businessman to get into that group and to learn from their experiences. And then once I've done that, encourage black people <coughs> to develop the sor same sorts of things, to develop their community in the same way white people have. Thank you. I'd like to ask you for a black deaf man who may have hearing children, what would you recommend for 
the type of communication with those children? I have a son who's hearing, and I've really encouraged him to learn sign language. Just knowing his parents are deaf will be able to communicate much more easily. And, well, not in school, of course, but naturally at home, he can use sign language. And then whenever he's with people, whether they're deaf or hard of hearing, he'll be able to communicate with them. And I think you can share understanding at a much <coughs> deeper level that way. For me, I have two hearing sons and a wife who's deaf. And she's not black deaf, she's Hispanic deaf. So the children, they're interesting. The boy is rather what? No, I'm sorry. Well, uh, he, uh, he's not really white, but uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think I explained that very well. But uh, he's a black hearing person. I mean, they're ages five and four. And one night he said, look and watch the kids. See what they do. And my boy learned some sign language because my mother is completely, or his mother is completely deaf. And she had taught him as he was growing up because he communicated with his mother <coughs> frequently. So at home, he would tend to talk often <coughs> through sign language. And then when he's around deaf people, he'll sign. But the boy said, uh, says, he said, well, you're, my brother's white and you're black and my other boy, who's five, he thought he was brown, not black. I mean, that's where he identified himself. And he asked me what color I was. And I said I wasn't black, I was brown. <laughs> and I was teasing him, you know, giving him a hard time. And he said, no, he wasn't black, he was brown. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our time is running out. We'll be right back. Thank you very much, John and Carl, for sharing your experiences about being black and deaf. We've learned so much. Thank you for watching.